Bullets ricochet off the wall. Explosions fill the streets. A soldier is pinned down by the enemy. This could be the end for him. Luckily, he has his Kumlauf attachment allowing him to fire around any corner, but the weapon jams. Next, he pulls out his heat ray to fry the enemy, but with a little sunscreen, it's rendered ineffective. It's time to get the hell out of Dodge. The soldier hops in his rota buggy, hits the accelerator, and switches on the propeller system to fly off into the sunset. But like all those other weird weapons in his arsenal, this one fails as well. It's fair to say he's having a bad day. These weapons sound like something out of a bad spy movie, but each one was constructed and tested for combat. However, due to design flaws, none of them are still in use. Let's find out which weird weapon was the worst of the worst. Since humans could walk, there's been conflict. In the early days of war, elephants were the tanks of the army. These massive creatures posed a huge problem for generals that needed to be overcome, so in the 2nd century BC, the Romans came up with what they thought was an ingenious plan to stop enemy elephants in their tracks. In order to do this, they did something really awful to a bunch of pigs. The Romans knew that the elephants didn't like hawks. For whatever reason, the fast-moving, squealing animals frightened the large elephants, causing them to rear up and throw their handlers off their backs. But the Romans wanted to take things up a notch. They would cover their pigs in tar and light them on fire. The pigs would then become a primitive form of an anti-tank missile. However, these biological flaming missiles ended up being a terrible idea. The pig couldn't be aimed, and it didn't last very long before it died. This meant that when the pigs were released, they ended up running away from the battle and dying in a smoldering heap without so much as passing by the enemy. There were even cases where the flaming pigs backfired by running through the ranks of the Roman soldiers and setting them on fire instead of the enemy. All in all, the flaming pig missiles were an epic fail. The next weapon didn't go up in smoke like the pigs, but froze to death instead. Project Habakkuk seemed like such a terrible idea, it's amazing how far it actually got. The Habakkuk was conceived of by a British engineer named Geoffrey Pike during World War II. His idea was to build an entire aircraft carrier out of pikecrete, a mixture of ice and wood pulp. That's right, Mr. Pike wanted to construct a naval ship out of ice. It isn't hard to guess what problems led to the failure of that vessel. The Habakkuk was supposed to be a way to launch aircraft from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to combat German U-boats. One of the reasons aircraft carriers were rare during the war was because they required a massive amount of resources. Steel and other metals were necessary to build tanks, guns, and aircraft, so using them to build giant ships was not always cost-effective. Pike proposed making whole ships out of ice to combat the supply chain problem. The pikecrete mixture was around 86% water and 14% wood pulp, both of which were plentiful at the time. However, constructing an entire aircraft carrier out of mostly ice had its problems. A 1,000-ton model was constructed in Canada to show that the ice ship was a viable option, but they ran into some issues. The most prominent was that the entire hull began to melt. The pike crete needed to be kept around 0 degrees Fahrenheit, which was much more easily said than done. The air temperature rarely was that low, and the water temperature was never that cold. This meant the engineers needed to develop a way to install air conditioning systems across the ship. Clearly, this wouldn't be cost-effective and also led to hundreds of other problems, it became clear that an aircraft carrier made out of ice would not be the future of the Royal Navy. The entire project was deemed a failure and the British continued to build steel ships the old-fashioned way. But the Habakkuk was not the only embarrassing failed ship in military history. Russia also created a strange-looking vessel that was a complete disaster. The Novgorod was a circular ship that looked like a giant floating dinner plate. The Russians thought it was a brilliant design, but they would soon come to find it was a big round mistake. The hull was just over 100 feet in diameter and was mounted with large guns that could be used to defend the ship or fire onto land. A few years after its completion, the Novgorod was put to test during the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 and 1878. The Novgorod was sent down the Danube River to aid in battle. However, when it unleashed its cannons, something embarrassing happened. The turrets on the vessel were placed on turntables so they could be adjusted to aim at different targets. However, due to loose locks, when the cannon fired, they spun around on their turntables and the crew would need to wait for them to stop spinning before reorienting them and firing again. This would later be fixed by reinforcing the locking mechanism, but it was enough to create a persistent myth about how the entire ship would rotate whenever fired. Its circular shape also made the Novgorod bulky and extremely hard to maneuver. This meant it needed to move slowly, and by the time it was positioned correctly, the battle would already be over. The Russians got so fed up with the failings of the Novgorod that they decided to tie it up at the dock and just leave it. 
the circular ship seemed to be more amusing to watch than helpful during a fight. After the war, the Novgorod was retired. One of the biggest fears for a soldier is being out in the open during combat. This next failed military device literally put the soldier in the worst position of all. The VZ-1 Pawnee was a flying platform that would carry a soldier up into the sky using a helicopter-like propeller system. The idea seems pretty cool, as the soldier would be able to hover in mid-air. But when you think about it, all the flying platform did was make that soldier an easy target. The device was developed in the 1950s by Hiller Helicopters. It had two rotors contained within the platform that allowed it to fly and hover where a soldier stood on top of the contraption. There were no wings, and the rotor was fixed, meaning the only way for the soldier to move the VZ-1 Pawnee was by shifting his body weight from side to side. This could put him in a precarious position as he tried to return fire at the enemy while controlling the platform. It also didn't help that it would only take one or two direct hits from enemy bullets to damage the device and send the soldier plummeting to his death. The VZ-1 Pawnee was cool to look at and must have been fun in testing, but it just didn't make any sense in combat. This led to the whole thing being scrapped before anyone was sent flying into battle on them. The VZ-1 was not the only failed flying contraption of the time, however. In fact, during World War II, the British tried to make a flying car, but the whole thing ended in disaster. There were no bad ideas when it came to machines that could defeat the Nazis. However, the designers of the Hafner Rota Buggy might have taken the sentiment a little too far. The Hafner Rota Buggy was supposed to be a flying jeep, which allowed soldiers to cross over rivers, minefields, and enemy positions with the flick of a switch. The jeep was equipped with a rotor and tail fins, giving it some maneuverability but not much. The whole thing weighed a ton, meaning the fuel tank would drain almost instantly, resulting in the craft crashing to the ground. Also, a jeep is not the most aerodynamic vehicle, which made controlling it in flight rather tricky. The whole project was eventually scrapped and the British decided to use a plane towed glider to deliver land vehicles instead. Ready for a dad joke about weird failed weapons? The active denial system was such a horrible idea that the military is in denial that they ever tried it. The active denial system was basically a heat gun used to give enemy soldiers and unruly crowds intense burns. The weapon was built to look similar to a satellite dish and would focus radiation towards someone as a deterrent. This would make them incredibly uncomfortable and could cause entire crowds to disperse. The thought was that the high frequency waves hitting the person would make them feel like they're in a microwave causing burns, nausea, and extreme discomfort. The active denial system was built in 2010 and had a price tag of around $40 million. It lasted about a month in the field and was quickly recalled. The reason why made the R&D team shake their heads in shame. Instead of causing massive discomfort to whoever it was aimed at, the heat gun just gave them a slight sunburn. This might have been beneficial for breaking up crowds of people, but the heat gun would have had very little effect if you shot it at enemy in battle. In fact, anyone wearing sunscreen would have barely noticed the heat gun at all, as it would have protected them from the high-frequency waves. Just as a reminder, the active denial system was a weapon designed by the US military, meaning this failed weapon was your tax dollars at work. But this was nothing compared to the next failed weapon. It could literally blow off the user's head. Albert Bacon Pratt received patent number 118392 for a miniature cannon that was mounted onto a helmet. It seemed like a great idea to Pratt, and he even managed to get others on board. But in hindsight, the idea of mounting a gun to someone's head is full of problems. The firing mechanism was ingenious and weird at the same time. In order for the wearer to fire the weapon, all they needed to do was blow into a tube. The reason Pratt was so gung-ho about the idea was it allowed the wearer to subconsciously aim at their target just by looking at them. All the soldier needed to do was turn his head and blow. The real strange thing was that Pratt saw multiple applications for his helmet gun. He claimed it could be used in the kitchen. The whole contraption doubled as a cooking pot, with the barrel of the gun being used as a handle. Regardless of how many uses Pratt's helmet gun had, there were too many drawbacks to make the gun a feasible option. Pratt claimed the strong spring that loaded the next round into the barrel counteracted the recoil of the bullet being fired. However, this might have been over-exaggerated as some claim the recoil was strong enough to snap the head of its wearer. Also, there was that problem of jamming. The only way to fix the problem was by taking the entire helmet off your head and then taking it apart, and heaven forbid the round exploded in the chamber. This scenario would have quickly ended the user's life. During World War II, the Allies would try anything that they thought might help defeat Hitler, even if it was as crazy as strapping rockets to the wheels of a giant bomb delivery system. As the Allies prepared to launch an offensive off the coast of France to reclaim mainland Europe from the Axis powers, 
The scientists at Britain's Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapon Development came up with a crazy idea. They would break down Hitler's walls and defenses by ramming 4,000 pounds of explosives connected to two 10-foot-tall metal wheels. This weapon would be called the Great Panjandrum. The wildest part about the whole thing is how the wheels would move. In order to get the 4,000 pounds of explosives moving fast enough to ensure it would reach the wall before being intercepted, the British scientists attached rockets to the wheels. These rockets would allow the Great Panjandrum to move at 60 miles an hour. The main problem with this weapon was that if just one of the rockets failed, the Great Panjandrum would start spinning in circles or go wildly off course. As the test runs continued, the engineers believed they could solve the accuracy problem by adding more rockets to compensate for any that failed. Unfortunately, Unfortunately, the rockets started ripping themselves off the wheels and shooting across the testing field. This happened multiple times, almost killing the observers of the tests. It was decided the Great Panjandrum would be too much of a liability in the field of battle and was discarded. Throughout the history of warfare, there have been a series of delivery methods for dropping bombs. However, there are a few that you probably never knew existed. In World War II, a surgeon named Lytle Adams came up with the odd idea of attaching bombs to animals. His plan was to fasten little bombs to bats and have them infiltrate enemy bases. The bats would then roost in the buildings and the timed bombs would go off, bringing the structure's roof crumbling down. Bats seemed like the perfect delivery method since they can carry more than their body weight in cargo, they're plentiful, and they can be relatively cheap to breed if more are needed. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt was so intrigued by the idea that he gave it the go-ahead, and the bat bombs were tested. The military collected hundreds of Mexican free-tailed bats and recruited Louis Pfizer, the inventor of napalm, to design the detonation packs that would be secured to the creatures. As the war progressed, United States Command realized that the bat bombs would work exceptionally well in Japanese cities where many of the structures were made out of wood, cloth, and paper. This meant that once the bat bomb detonated, it would not just destroy the structure itself, but could cause a fire to sweep through an entire neighborhood. Luckily for the bats, this project was never implemented. During a test in Carlsbad, New Mexico, one of the bat bombs got loose and sought shelter under a fuel tank at the military base. Later that day, the bomb went off, blowing up the bat and everything else in the vicinity of the fuel tanker. After several failed training exercises and the deployment of the atomic bombs in Japan, the bats were retired from military service as they were no longer needed. The Japanese had their own bomb deployment system, and that was as big of a failure as Adams's bat bombs. However, it did lead to the only deaths in the continent U.S. as a result of an enemy weapon. In 1944, the Japanese deployed 9,000 fugos, or fire balloons, over the Pacific Ocean. Attached to each balloon were a 35-pound high explosive and eight firebombs. The Japanese military planned for the balloons to float along the jet stream until they reached the coast of the United States, where they would descend and detonate. The ideal situation for the Japanese would have been the fugo creating massive wildfires, sending the west coast into chaos. The crazy thing is that around 389 balloons made it to the United States, which is a small number compared to the amount launched, but still not insignificant. When the balloons landed, almost all of them failed to detonate or cause any damage. In fact, two of the Fugos actually floated back to Japan and fell on their own island. Sadly, one Fugo did find its way to Oregon, where it fell to the forest floor. Five kids and a pregnant Sunday school teacher came across the Japanese bombs right as they went off. Everyone in the group was killed, making it the only place on the American continent where death resulted from enemy action in World War II. However, killing five kids in a Sunday school teacher and her unborn baby was not the outcome that the Japanese had hoped for with their 9,000 fire balloons. They were quickly retired as failed weapons, and a year later, Japan surrendered, ending World War II. The weird Nazi weapon called the Windkanona literally blew so bad that it was deemed an utter failure. Windkanona translates to wind cannon in English and wasn't one of the Nazis' brightest ideas. The way the cannon was supposed to work was rather simple. The 35-foot-long metal tube would be filled with a mixture of hydrogen and ammonium and ignited. This would build up immense pressure inside of the tube that, when released, would send a shockwave of air up into the sky. The hope for the Nazis was that the shockwave would hit Allied planes overhead and knock them out of the sky. In trials, the Windkanona seemed promising, as it could snap wooden planks from 650 feet away. However, when aimed at airplanes moving hundreds of miles per hour in the sky, the wind cannon quickly became less effective. Even though on bombing runs planes dipped as low as 500 feet, the wind cannon shockwave would barely register as more than a slight turbulence to the pilots. The compressed air didn't seem to bother the metal airplanes that were built to withstand different pressures and choppy air when flying. 
Because of this failure, the Nazis decided to repurpose the wind cannon and use it on the ground to push away ground forces, but this too ended in disaster. The weapon was so large it was easily spotted from the air. This made it a perfect target for bombing runs or artillery strikes, which would have devastating consequences. The wind cannona was such a failure that the Allies didn't even know what the contraption was supposed to be used for until they stumbled across one at a Nazi training facility in 1945. It was there that the Allies' intelligence got a close look at the wind cannona and finally realized what the purpose of the failed weapon was. The Germans also developed a weapon with an easily identifiable purpose. The Krumlauf was a machine gun with a slight twist. That twist just happened to be in the barrel. The Krumlauf was a barrel attachment to the Sturmgewehr 44 machine gun. It was supposed to allow a soldier to shoot around corners without exposing himself to enemy fire. The Krumlauf was also designed to be used by soldiers in tanks. They could stick their Krumlauf out the small holes and fire their gun to fend off enemies placing mines in their path or armed with anti tank weapons. This might have seemed like a good idea, but the weapon came with all sorts of problems. It should come as no surprise that the barrel did not last long, as every time the gun was shot it had to take the full force of a bullet and change its trajectory. This put enormous amounts of strain on the Krumlauf and even caused bullets to shatter on their way out of the muzzle. The shattered bullet would send tiny shards of shrapnel in all directions, making the gun inaccurate and dangerous to friendly soldiers standing nearby. The Krumlauf did not see much combat and was melted down to be repurposed into more useful weapons. And speaking of dangerous projectiles, one United States company manufactured a rifle called the Gyrojet that fired many missiles. In 1960, a company called the MBA Associates developed a Gyrojet to help soldiers hit targets from long distances. The plan was to use projectiles equipped with tiny rockets and a gyroscope to help them maintain their trajectory and course. Once fired, the miniature missile's microjets would kick on, allowing it to accelerate and adjust for wind and gravity. It seemed like a great idea that would make snipers' lives much easier, but the weapon ran into all sorts of problems. Since the projectile's rockets only kicked in once it left the gun, the gyrojet was pretty useless at close range unless it was used as a club. The intricacies that allowed the gun to fire without blowing up required a lot of moving parts. That jammed frequently. This meant the gyrojet was incredibly unreliable, which is not what a soldier wants in their weapons. In the 1950s, the US military thought they were onto something special when they developed a plane that took off straight up into the air like a helicopter the tail sitter would be a failure, but would pave the way for other successful aircraft like the Harrier jet in the future. The tail sitter was designed in the 1950s by the Navy to fix the problem of airplanes taking off and landing without much runway to work with. They did the best they could with the technology available to them. The tail sitter was a tiny plane with a complex propeller on the front, which allowed it to take off and land vertically, thus eliminating the need for a runway. However, these planes ran into all sorts of problems. Even the most skilled pilots found landing incredibly difficult, taking off and then then moving the aircraft into a horizontal position wasn't quite as bad, but when it came time to put the tail sitter back down on the landing platform, the plane would often tip over. Other times, the pilot would not be able to slow down fast enough, and the back of the aircraft became damaged as it impacted the ground. The military eventually gave up on the tail sitter, and it was deemed a failure. To be fair, the idea for vertical takeoff never totally disappeared, and although the tail sitter never made it to the front lines, many other aircraft based on the same premise have. One Cold War weapon was not only a bad idea but had a terrible name as well. The United States military came up with a satellite that would shoot enemy missiles out of the sky by launching bowling ball sized pieces of tungsten at them. The unfortunate name given to this weapon was Brilliant Pebbles. It seemed like the Strategic Defense Initiative could have come up with something slightly better or a little more ominous than Brilliant Pebbles for their space based weapon, but that's what they went with. Brilliant Pebbles was supposed to work by launching a series of satellites into space with several projectiles aboard each. These projectiles could then be shot out of the satellite to intercept enemy missiles flying through the atmosphere. It is unclear what made the researchers think this was a good idea, or that it would even work, but they continued to roll with it. In order for Brilliant Pebbles to have any chance of succeeding, there needed to be at least 4,000 of them in orbit. This would cost astronomical amounts of money for weapons that would most likely miss their targets almost every time. After a good long look at the program, the US military scrapped the idea. It's hard to tell if they were more embarrassed by the weapon's failure or its name. A more recent failed weapon was a type of laser, but this was not just any laser. It was planned to be used while flying through the sky like an X-wing. 
The flying laser cannon, also known as the YAL-1 airborne laser, was mounted on the nose of a plane. It made the aircraft look a little like a dolphin, but that wasn't the worst part about this failed weapon. Its primary purpose was to shoot a high-powered beam out of its laser cannon to destroy any missiles or aircraft in the vicinity. The main problem with the laser was that it required a massive amount of energy to work. All of this power needed to be produced by chemical oxygen iodine laser modules, which are incredibly heavy. The power supply weighed down the entire plane, causing its fuel efficiency and top speed to plummet. In the end, the flying laser cannon was more trouble than it was worth, and the military decided to retire the weapon before it could even be used for its intended purpose of blowing things out of the sky. Now watch weirdest military weapons they actually used in World War I.